Welcome to today's Triple Z. The Triple Z podcast is a daily program that you can use to help you fall asleep each night. Just turn down the volume, lay back, relax, and enjoy as you fall asleep. The Life and Achievements of Don Quixote de la Mancha is a Spanish epic novel by Miguel de Cervantes. Originally published in two parts, in 1605 and 1615, its full title is The Ingenious Gentleman Don Quixote of La Mancha. A founding work of Western literature, it is often labeled as the first modern novel and one of the greatest works ever written. Don Quixote is also one of the most translated books in the world. If you enjoy our program, Please be sure to write us a review on your podcast platform and share us with a friend. You both might sleep just a little better at night. Our website is triple Z, that's three Z's dot media. You can also like and share our content on Facebook or our Instagram account ZZZ Media Podcast. Music for today's episode was provided by the Sleep Channel on Spotify. Chapter 77, which gives a further account of Sancho Panza's behavior in his government. The history informs us that Sancho was conducted from the court of justice to a sumptuous palace where, in a spacious room, he found the cloth laid and a magnificent entertainment prepared. As soon as he entered, the wind music played and four pages waited on him with water for washing his hands, which he did with a great deal of gravity. The instruments ceasing, Sancho sat down at the upper end of the table, for there was no seat but there, and the cloth was only laid for one. A certain personage, who afterwards appeared to be a physician, came and stood at his elbow with a whalebone wand in his hand. Then they took off a curious white cloth that lay over the dishes on the table and discovered a great variety of fruit and other eatables. One that looked like a student said grace, a page put a laced cloth under Sancho's chin and another set a dish of fruit before him. But he had hardly put one bit into his mouth before the physician touched the dish with his wand and then it was taken away by a page in an instant. Immediately another, with meat, was put in the place, but Sancho no sooner offered to taste it than the doctor, with the wand, conjured it away as fast as the fruit. Sancho was amazed at this sudden removal and, looking about him on the company, asked them whether the dinner was only to shoo off their sleight of hand. My lord governor, answered the physician, You are to eat here no otherwise than according to the use and custom of other islands where there are governors. I am a doctor of physic, my lord, and have a salary allowed me in this island for taking charge of the governor's health, and I am more careful of it than of my own, studying night and day his constitution, that I may know what to prescribe when he falls sick. Now the chief thing I do is, to attend him always at his meals, to let him eat what I think convenient for him and to prevent his eating what I imagine to be prejudicial to his health. Therefore I ordered the fruit to be taken away because it is too cold and moist and the other dish because it is as much too hot and over seasoned with spices which are apt to increase thirst and he that drinks much destroys and consumes the radical moisture which is the fuel of life. So then Quoth Sancho, this dish of roasted partridges here can do me no manner of harm. Hold, said the physician, the Lord Governor shall not eat of them while I live to prevent it. Why so? cried Sancho. Because, answered the doctor, our great master, Hippocrates, the North Star and Luminary of Physic, says, in one of his aphorisms, on this saturation mala, Perdices autumn pessima, that is, all repletion is bad, but that of partridges is worst of all. If it be so, said Sancho, 
Let Mr. Doctor see which of all these dishes on the table will do me the most good and least harm and let me eat of that without having it whisked away with his wand. For, by my hopes and the pleasures of government, as I live I am ready to die with hunger and not to allow me to eat my victuals. let Mr. Doctor say what he will is the way to shorten my life and not to lengthen it. Very true, my lord, replied the physician, however, I am of opinion you ought not to eat of these rabbits, nor would I have you taste that veal. Indeed, if it were neither roasted nor pickled, something might be said, but as it is, it must not be. Well, then, said Sancho, what think you of that huge dish yonder that smokes so? I take it to be an alia padrida and that being a hodgepodge of so many sorts of victuals, sure I cannot but light upon something there that will be both wholesome and pleasant. Absit, cried the doctor, for be such an ill thought from us, no diet in the world yields worse nutriment than those mishmashes do. Simple medicines are generally allowed to be better than compounds, for, in a composition, there may happen a mistake by the unequal proportion of the ingredients, but simples are not subject to that accident. Therefore, what I would advise at present as a fit diet for the governor for the preservation and support of his health is a hundred of small wafers and a few thin slices of marmalade to strengthen his stomach and help digestion. Sancho hearing this, leaned back upon his chair and looking earnestly in the doctor's face, very seriously asked him what his name was and where he had studied. My lord, answered he, I am called Dr. Pedro Rizio de Aguero. The name of the place where I was born is Tertiafura and lies between Caracol and El Matabar del Campo on the right hand and I took my degree of doctor in the University of Osuna. Hark you, said Sancho, in a mighty chafe, Mr. Dr. Pedro Rizio de Aguero, take yourself away. Avoid the room this moment, or assuredly I'll get me a good cudgel, and, beginning with your carcass, will so belabor and rib roast all the physic mongers in the island that I will not leave there in one of the tribe, of those, I mean, that are ignorant quacks, for as for learned and wise physicians, I will make much of them and honor them like so many angels. Once more, Pedro Rizio, I say, get out of my presence. Avant! Or I will take the chair I sit upon and comb your head with it to some purpose and let me be called to an account about it when I give up my office. I do not care. I will clear myself by saying I did the world good service in ridding it of a bad physician the plague of a commonwealth. Let me eat, I say, or let them take their government again, for an office that will not afford a man his victuals is not worth two horse beans. The physician was terrified, seeing the governor in such a heat, and would at once have slunk out of the room, had not the sound of a post horn in the street been heard that moment, whereupon the steward, immediately looking out of the window, turned back and said there was an express come from the duke, doubtless with some dispatch of importance. Presently the messenger entered with haste and concern in his looks and pulling a packet out of his bosom, delivered it to the governor. Sancho gave it to the steward and ordered him to read the direction, which was this, to Don Sancho Panza, governor of the island of Barataria, to be delivered into his own hands or those of his secretary. Who is my secretary? cried Sancho. It is I, my lord, answered one that was standing by, for I can write and read, and am a Biscainer. That last qualification is enough to make thee set up for secretary to the emperor himself, said Sancho. Open the letter, then, and see what it says. The new secretary did so, and having perused the dispatch by himself, told the governor that it was a business that was to be told only in private. 
Sancho ordered everyone to leave the room except the steward and the carver and then the secretary read what follows. I have received information, my lord Don Sancho Panza, that some of our enemies intend to attack your island with great fury one of these nights. You ought, therefore, to be watchful and stand upon your guard that you may not be found unprovided. I have also had intelligence from faithful spies that there are four men got into the town in disguise to murder you, your abilities being regarded as a great obstacle to the enemy's designs. Look about you, take heed how you admit strangers to speak with you, and eat nothing sent you as a present. I will take care to send you assistance if you stand in need of it and in everything I rely on your prudence. From our castle, the 16th of August, at 4 in the morning, your friend, the Duke. Sancho was astonished at the news, and those that were with him were no less concerned. But at last, turning to the steward, I will tell you, said he, what is first to be done in this case and that with all speed. Clap that same Dr. Rizio in a dungeon, for if any body has a mind to kill me, it must be he, and that with a lingering death, the worst of deaths, hunger starving. However, said the carver, I am of opinion your honor ought not to eat any of the things that stand here before you, for they were sent in by some of the convents, and it is a common saying, the devil lurks behind the cross which nobody can deny, quoth Sancho, and therefore let me have, for the present, but a luncheon of bread, and some four pounds of raisins, there can be no poison in that, for, in short, I cannot live without eating, and, if we must be in readiness against these battles, we had need be well victualled. Meanwhile, secretary, do you send my lord duke an answer, and tell him his order shall be fulfilled in every part. Remember me kindly to my lady, and beg of her not to forget to send one on purpose with my letter and bundle to Teresa Panza, my wife, which I shall take as a special favor, and I will be mindful to serve her to the best of my power. And when your hand is in, you may crowd in my service to my master Don Quixote de la Mancha, that he may see I am neither forgetful nor ungrateful. The rest I leave to you. Put in what you will, and do your part like a good secretary and a staunch Biscainer. Now, take away here, and bring me something to eat, and then you shall see I am able to deal with all the spies, wizards, and cutthroat dogs that dare to meddle with me in my island. At that time a page entering the room, my lord, said he, There is a countryman without desires to speak with your lordship about business of great consequence. It is a strange thing, cried Sancho, that one must be still plagued with these men of business. Is it possible they should be such sots as not to understand this is not a time for business? Do they fancy that we governors and distributors of justice are made of iron and marble? and have no need of rest and refreshment like other creatures of flesh and blood? If my government does but last, as I shrewdly guess it will not, I will get some of these men of business laid by the heels. Well, for once, let the fellow come in, but first take heed he be not one of the spies or ruffian rogues that would murder me. As for that, said the page, I dare say he had no hand in the plot. Poor soul, he looks as if he could not help it, there is no more harm in him, seemingly, than in a piece of good bread. There is no need to fear, said the steward, since we are all here by you. But, hark you, quoth Sancho, now Dr. Rizio is gone, might not I eat something that has some substance in it, though it were but a crust and an onion? At night, answered the carver, Your honor shall have no cause to complain, supper shall make amends for the want of your dinner. Now the countryman came in, and, by his looks, seemed to be a good, 
harmless soul, which is my Lord Governor, quoth he. Who but he that sits in the chair, answered the secretary. I humble myself to his worship's presence, quoth the fellow, and with that, falling on his knees, begged to kiss his hand, which Sancho refused, but bid him rise, and tell him what he had to say. The countryman then got up, my lord, said he, I am a husbandman of Miguel Tura, a town some two leagues from Ciudad Real. Here is another tertia fura, quoth Sancho, well, go on, friend, I know the place full well, it is not far from our town. If it please you, said the countryman, my business is this, I was married, by heaven's mercy, in the face of our holy mother the church, and I have two boys that take their learning at the college, the youngest studies to become a bachelor, and the eldest to be a master of arts. I am a widower, because my wife is dead, she died, if it please you, or, to speak more truly, she was killed, as one may say, by a doctor. Now, sir, I must tell you, continued the farmer, that that son of mine, the bachelor of arts that is to be, fell in love with a maiden of our town, Clara Perlerino by name, the daughter of Andrew Perlerino, a mighty rich farmer, and Perlerino is not the right name neither, but, because the whole generation of them is troubled with the palsy, they used to be called, from the name of that complaint, Perlaticos, but now they go by that of Perlerino, and truly it fits the young woman rarely, for she is a precious pearl for beauty, especially if you stand on her right side and view her, she looks like a flower in the fields. On the left, indeed, she does not look altogether so well, for there she wants an eye, which she lost by the smallpox, that has digged many pits somewhat deep all over her face, but those that wish her well, say that is nothing, and that those pits are so many graves to bury lovers' hearts in. I hope my Lord Governor will pardon me for dwelling thus on the picture, seeing it is merely out of my hearty love and affection for the girl. Prithee, go on as long as thou wilt, said Sancho, I am mightily taken with thy discourse, and, if I had but dined, I would not desire a better dessert. Alas, sir, all I have said is nothing, could I set before your eyes her pretty carriage and her shape you would admire. But that is not to be done. So far so good, said Sancho, but let us suppose you have drawn her from head to foot, what is it you would be at now? Come to the point, friend, without so many windings and turnings and going round about the bush. Sir, said the farmer, I would desire your honor to do me the kindness to give me a letter of accommodation to the father of my daughter-in-law, beseeching him to be pleased to let the marriage be fulfilled, seeing we are not unlike neither in estate nor bodily concerns, for to tell you the truth, my lord governor, my son is bewitched, and having once had the ill luck to fall into the fire, the skin of his face is shriveled up like a piece of parchment and his eyes are somewhat sore and full of room. But when all is said, he has the temper of an angel, and were he not apt to thump and belabor himself now and then in his fits, you would take him to be a saint. Have you anything else to ask, honest man? said Sancho. Only one thing more, quoth the farmer, but I am somewhat afraid to speak it yet I cannot find in my heart to let it rot within me, and, therefore, I must out with it. I would desire your worship to bestow on me some three hundred or six hundred ducats towards my bachelor's portion, only to help him to begin the world and furnish him a house, for, in short, they would live by themselves, without being subject to the impertinencies of a father-in-law. Well, said Sancho, See if you would have anything else, if you would, do not let fear or bashfulness be your hindrance. Out with it, man. No, truly, quoth the farmer, and he had scarcely spoken the words when the governor, 
Starting up and laying hold of the chair he sat on, you brazen-faced impudent country booby, cried he, get out of my presence this moment or I will crack your jolter head with this chair. You vagabond, dost thou come at this time of day to ask me for six hundred ducats? Where should I have them, Claude Pate? And if I had them, why should I give them thee? What care I for Miguel Tura or all the generation of the Perlerinos? Avoid the room, I say, or I'll be as good as my word. It is not a day and a half that I have been governor and thou wouldst have me possess six hundred ducats already. The steward made signs to the farmer to withdraw and he went out accordingly hanging down his head and to all appearance very much afraid lest the governor should make good his angry threats for the cunning knave knew very well how to act his part. But let us leave Sancho in his angry mood and let there be peace and quietness while we return to Don Quixote, whom we left with his face covered over with plasters, the scratches which he had got having obliged him to no less than eight days retirement, during which time there happened that which we promised to relate with the same punctuality and veracity with which all the particulars of this history are detailed. Chapter 78 What happened to Don Quixote with Donna Rodriguez? as also other passages worthy to be recorded. Don Quixote, thus unhappily hurt, was extremely discontented and melancholy. He was some days without appearing in public, and one night, when he was thus confined to his apartment as he lay awake reflecting on his misfortunes and Altisidora's importunities, he perceived somebody was opening his chamber door with a key and presently imagined that the damsel herself was coming. No, said he, loud enough to be heard, the greatest beauty in the universe shall never remove the dear idea of the charming fair that is engraved and stamped in the very center of my heart and the most secret recesses of my breast. No, thou only mistress of my soul, whether transformed into a country girl or into one of the nymphs of the golden Tagus, that with silk and gold in the loom, whether Merlin or Montesinos detained thee where they pleased, be where thou wilt, thou still art mine, and wherever I shall be, I must and will be thine. Just as he ended his speech, the door opened. He fixed his eyes on it, and when he expected to have seen the doleful Altisidora, he beheld a most reverend matron approaching in a white veil so long that it covered her from head to foot. Betwixt her left hand fingers she carried half a candle lighted and held her right before her face to keep the blaze of the taper from her eyes which were hidden by a huge pair of spectacles. All the way she trod very softly and moved at a very slow pace. Don Quixote watched her motions and observing her garb and silence took her for some enchantress that came in that dress to practice her wicked sorceries upon him and began to make the sign of the cross as fast as he could. The vision advanced all the while and being got to the middle of the chamber, lifted up its eyes and saw Don Quixote thus making a thousand crosses on his breast. But if he was astonished at the sight of such a figure, she was no less affrighted at his so that as soon as she spied him, so lank, but patched and muffled up, bless me, cried she, what is this? With the sudden fright she dropped the candle, and now, being in the dark, as she was running out, the length of her dress made her stumble, and down she fell in the middle of the chamber. Don Quixote at the same time was in great anxiety. Phantom, cried he, or whatsoever thou art, I conjure thee to tell me who thou art and what thou requirest of me. The old woman, hearing herself thus conjured, judged Don Quixote's fears by her own and therefore, with a low and doleful voice, my lord Don Quixote, said she, if you are he, I am neither a phantom nor a ghost, but Donna Rodriguez, my lady duchess's matron of honor, who come to you about a certain grievance of the nature of those which you used to redress. Tell me, 
Donna Rodriguez, said Don Quixote, are not you come to manage some love intrigue? If you are, take it from me, you will lose your labor, it is all in vain, thanks to the peerless beauty of my lady Dulcinea del Toboso. In a word, madam, provided you come not on some such embassy, you may go light your candle and return, and we will talk of anything you please. I have come with no such purpose, said the duenna. But stay a little, I will go light my candle, and then I will tell you my misfortunes, for it is you that sets to right everything in the world. This said, away she went, without stopping for an answer. Donna Rodriguez, having returned, sat down in a chair at some distance, without taking off her spectacles or setting down the candle. After they had both remained some minutes in silence, the first that broke it was the night. Now, madam, said he, you may freely unburden your heart, sure of attention to your complaints and assistance in your distress. I believe as much, said the matron, and promised myself no less charitable an answer from a person of so graceful and pleasing a presence. The case, then, is, noble sir, that though you see me sitting in this chair, in the middle of Aragon, in the habit of an insignificant unhappy duenna, I am of Asturias de Oviedo, and one of the best families in that province. But my hard fortune, and the neglect of my parents, brought me to Madrid, where, because they could do no better, they placed me with a court lady to be her chambermaid. And, though I say it, for all manner of plain work I was never outdone by anyone in all my life. My father and mother left me at service and returned home, and some few years after they both died and went to heaven, I hope, for they were very good and religious Catholics. Then was I left an orphan and wholly reduced to the sorrowful condition of such court servants, wretched wages, and a slender allowance. About the same time the gentleman usher fell in love with me before I dreamt of any such thing. He was somewhat stricken in years, had a fine beard, was a personable man, and, what is more, as good a gentleman as the king, for he was of the mountains. We did not carry matters so close, but it came to my lady's ear, and so, without more ado, she caused us to be married in the face of our holy mother of the Catholic Church, from which marriage sprung a daughter who made an end of my good fortune, if I had any. When she came to be sixteen years of age, who should happen to fall in love with her but a rich farmer's son that lives in one of my Lord Duke's villages not far off, he courted her, gained her consent, and was under promise of marriage to her, but he now refuses to make his word good. The Duke is no stranger to the business, for I have made complaint to him about it many and many times, and begged of him to enjoin the young man to wed my daughter, but he turns his deaf ear to me, and cannot endure I should speak to him of it, because the young knave's father is rich, and lends the Duke money, and is bound for him upon all occasions, so that he would by no means disoblige him. Therefore, sir, I apply myself to your worship and beseech you to see my daughter righted either by entreaties or by force, seeing everybody says you were sent into the world to redress grievances and assist those in adversity. Be pleased to cast an eye of pity on my daughter's orphan state, her beauty, her youth, and all her other good parts, for, on my conscience, of all the damsels my lady has, there is not one can come up to her by a mile, no, not she that is cried up as the finest of them all, whom they call Altisidora, I am sure she is not to be named the same day, for, let me tell you, sir, all is not gold that glisters. The same Altisidora, after all, is a hoity-toity that has more vanity than beauty and less modesty than confidence. Scarce had this passed when the chamber door flew open which so startled Donna Rodriguez that she let fall her candle and the room remained as dark as a wolf's mouth, as the saying is, 
and presently the poor duenna felt somebody hold her by the throat and squeeze it so hard that it was not in her power to cry out, and another beat her so unmercifully that it would have moved anyone but those that did it to pity. Don Quixote was not without compassion, yet he lay silent, not knowing what the meaning of this bustle might be, and fearing lest the tempest that poured on the poor matron might also light upon himself, and not without reason, for indeed, after the mute executioners had well beat the old gentlewoman, who durst not cry out, they came to Don Quixote, and pinched him so hard and so long, that in his own defense he could not forbear laying about him with his fists as well as he could, till at last, after the scuffle had lasted about half an hour, the invisible phantoms vanished. Donna Rodriguez, lamenting her hard fortune, left the room without speaking a word to the night. As for him, he remained where he was, sadly pinched and tired, and very moody and thoughtful, not knowing who this wicked enchanter could be that had used him in that manner. But now let us leave him and return to Sancho Panza, who calls upon us as the order of our history requires.